Hey there guys, Matthew George here with FreeCCNAWorkbook.com and in this video I'm going to be discussing and demonstrating Lab 1-4 which is configuring a Cisco Access Server. Now first off, uh, you're probably wondering what an Access Server is. Uh, if you don't know what they are, they're basically a device that allows you to uh, access console ports or serial ports uh, using an IP address. It's basically kind of like a, a server that runs an operating system that has a bunch of serial ports. And ultimately, the functionality is that you're able to telnet to an IP address and have uh, serial access through the access server. So there's actually a few different models that Cisco has uh, that work as access servers. The first one being the 2509. It has eight ports of asynchronous lines. And the 2511 has 16 ports. However, there are two network modules that you can purchase called the Network Module 16AS, which is asynchronous lines, and the 32AS, Network Module 32AS, which has 32 lines. Now, there's no reason you're ever going to need a 32AS uh, unless you have an insanely huge lab. Now, for the CCNA, if, if you're building a lab to match the free CCNA topology, all you need is a 2509, and there's actually two separate versions of the 2500 series access servers. You have one version that uses an octopus cable, it basically looks like a SCSI cable, and it breaks out into eight separate lines. And also there is a registered jack version called a 2509-RJ or a 2511-RJ. These versions basically give you the ability to create your own cables uh, by making a rollover cable, and it, you can make them your own length. So that way, you know, you can have better looking cable management if you want. Uh, or different color cables or whatever toots your horn. So, anyhow, <clears throat> with all that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. I'm, my brain here is cranking out a few gears, you know. Anyhow, uh, lab prerequisites. Make sure you have a console session open with an access server. Uh, keep in mind you do need a real access server for this lab. You can't use GNS3 to emulate this lab. Uh, in this lab I will be using a 3620 with the network module 32AS for demonstrational purposes. And uh, the objectives are pretty simple. First you assign a host name, configure a loopback interface address, uh, set up local IP host records for the reverse telnet sessions. Uh, and then you got to configure the async lines and then you test it. So cool stuff. With that being said, let's get started. So first off, create a host name, figure terminal, host name, I'm a access server, la di da. Sounds pretty good to me. And now we need to create a loopback interface. So interface hello zero, which is loopback zero, and we're gonna assign a locally significant IP address to this interface. It does not have to be routed. So IP address 10.10.10.10 uh, .10 sounds good with a host subnet mask. Helps if I get rid of that extra period. Uh, now that is done, you should see the interface come up. And it doesn't, but it's up anyways. So now that the, uh, the interface is configured, now we need to configure the local host name records, which is what's going to be used by the access server uh, to tell, hey, when you type in like R1, the router automatically knows to go to IP address 10, 10, 10, 10 using a specific port number. So we will do this using the IP host command, and for, then you specify the name of the host, so this is going to be R1, and followed by the line number. Uh, if you're not for sure what lines are on your device, you can do a show line. Well, in global config, you have to do the show command, so do show line. And like I said, this is a network module 32AS, so I have 64 lines, I mean, 32 lines, starting with line 33, and it goes all the way up to 64. So, IP host R1, and router 1 is going to be on line 33, so when you configure a Cisco access server, you will always use the number 2000 uh, before the line number, so 2000. 33, followed by the IP address, which in this case is the locally significant IP address, which is 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10. Now we're going to do this again for uh, all the routers in the lab topology. So R2 will be on line 
2034, R3 will be on 2035, R4 will be on 2036, R5 will be on 2037. Switch 1 starts at 2039, because I actually have six routers in my topology, not five. So it's going to be 2039 for me. However, if you're using a 2509, you're just going to have eight lines, and it's going to start with 2001 uh, through 2009. So line one, line two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, in which case, you would use 2001 here, 2002, 2003, so on and so forth. So switch one will be 2000. 39 for me. Switch 2 is 2040. And switch 3 is 2041. Now that the, the host records are configured, it's now time to configure the lines. So if you do a show run, you can see the configuration. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see here that these are the lines that I was talking about, the asynchronous lines. Uh, those are the serial ports, so to speak. So do a line 3364 to get under line configuration mode. And from here, we want to uh, specify no exec. So this will tell basically the router on those lines that the devices at the end of those lines cannot establish an exec session with that access server. And for a terminal server or an access server, you want to only enable Telnet on those lines because Telnet is the protocol that you're going to be using over the lines to establish a console session with devices using those lines. So transport input Telnet. And if you want, you can configure the exact timeout option. Uh, Basically, this says, hey, if you have a exec session started uh, using reverse telnet, it will not time out if you leave your session idle. Now that is all done, you're practically finished with most of the hard configuration. So now you can basically verify the configuration. So I'm going to type in R1, and voila, there we go. As you can see now, what's actually happening on the access server is when you type R1, it's actually referencing this this uh, host record syntax that says, hey, for R1, I am going to tell it to 10, 10, 10, 10 on port 2033. So in order to get out of this line, you have to use the, uh, the keystroke combination of control, shift, six, and then X. So that is actually, you know, it's kind of hard to master at first. You have to do it at a certain speed. If you do it too fast, don't worry. If you do it too slow, it doesn't work. Uh, but eventually you'll get the hang of it if you continue to use the access server in this manner. Now, when you open a line, if you press enter right now, it will automatically go back to that line. And actually, that is quite annoying when you're doing work. So if you do like show, run, and you press Q, uh, actually, not Q, but if you just press enter again, accidentally, it will automatically take you back to the last line that you have a session established with. If you want to clear this line, uh, you can use the clear command. Uh, just do a show line to see what lines are active. Uh, any of the lines that are active or have you know traffic on them or have an established exact session, you'll see a star next to it. As you can see here, line 33, which is router 1, has a star next to it, as well as line 39 and 44. Those lines also have stars, so that means those lines have sessions established on them. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to clear line 33. So going to ask me to confirm it. Voila, I have to press enter again. It will say line, uh, well, R1, connection R1 has been closed by foreign host. Now, this is all cool and dandy, but, you know, having to do the control shift 6x uh, is very time consuming, especially when you're going between different routers all the time. And uh, as you can see here, I'm using secure CRT. And... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. And Secure CRT has the option of using tabs across the top, which is a completely cool feature. So now you no longer have to open up separate Telnet sessions or separate putty windows. You can use Telnet uh, tabs, so to speak. 
Now I've already got some of the tabs here already created, but I'm going to go ahead and create a tab uh, just so I can show you how it's done. Actually, first off, let me assign an IP address to the fast Ethernet interface of this device so I can actually get to it from my PC. Uh, so IP address, you got 16 by 22, got 220 with a slash 24 bit bit mask. And ping my PC, make sure I'm able to get to my PC, and I'm good. So let me go ahead and create a session here, a telnet session. And drop it down the telnet. And the host name is going to be R1. Actually, this is going to be the IP address. 172.16.22.5, no, 220. And I was looking at that over there. And you're going to use the port number that is referenced in the, the host record, which will be 2033. And right here you have the option to name the session, so I'm just going to call it R1 and enter. I'm going to drag this baby right up here so that way it's all nice and perfect because I'm a perfectionist. And when I click on R1, voila, there it goes. You know, it's pretty cool. So basically what you're doing is you're actually telling Secure CRT to telnet to the IP address of the fast Ethernet interface on this access server uh, to port 2033. And when the traffic gets to that access server, it says, hey, I have a line uh, on 2033 or line 33. And the access server automatically uh, enables a exec session using Telnet uh, to establish a console session with the device at the end of that line. Now, I've already configured the other devices here. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and jump on router 2, uh, router 3, 4, 5, switch 1. That's not cool. Now, if you get this, I'm actually glad this came up. If you get this error right here, what, mean, what it means is that the line has currently got a session established on it. So if you show a line, that is actually the lines that were in use here, 39. So 39 is switch one. So clear line, 39. Now when you clear the line, you'll be able to connect to it. And that's a lot of crap. <laughs> So now I'm able to connect to line 39, which is switch 1, and jump on switch 2 here, and finally switch 3. So with all those sessions established, use the secure CRT, I'm just going to get out of the console session and close that out. And now I have a telnet session using the access server to all of the console ports on the, uh, on the lab's devices. So... It's pretty cool stuff, you know. Like I said, you don't have to have different putty windows or different uh, telnet sessions open, so that way you don't have to keep going through all the windows across the bottom and be like, oh, that's router 2, oh, that's router 4, oh, this is switch 1, so on and so forth. So it's really easy. It's right here in front of you. So if you need to get on router 3, just click router 3 tab, switch 1. You can get on switch 1 by clicking the switch 1 tab. So uh, with that being said, there is a few features of Secure CRT that I want to demonstrate because Secure CRT is totally awesome. Uh, Man, these, these features are just going to blow you away. I actually use these features quite a bit in production, and they are very, uh, very time-saving features, so to speak. If you use them effectively, uh, for example, I've used one of the features called the chat window. And in the chat window, you have the ability to send to all devices. So I'm going to go up here to edit. Actually, it's under view, chat window. And now you have this window down here, and if you do something like Shover, it will show you what uh, it will execute this command in the currently established tab window. It does not execute it on any of the other of the uh, tabs. However, if you right click on the tab, I mean the uh, chat window here, and click send to all tabs, and you do something like show where, what's going to happen? Wham, it goes across every one of these tabs all at once. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, this is pretty cool, but what can I use this for? And that's the beauty. Now, if you have a lot of Cisco switches or routers in an environment and you need to upgrade the iOS on these devices all at once, what you can do is you can actually do copy TFTP, the, uh, to flash, and you execute this command on all of the devices, and voila, you automatically copy the file to every single device without having to copy and paste, you know, 
and it's really nice, especially when you get into uh, chassis switches, uh, which you won't be dealing with with the CCNA. But if you further your studies into the CCMP and ultimately the CCIE, uh, you will eventually get the experience on chassis switches such as the 4500 series and the 6500 series. And in those platforms, you have to configure the boot variables uh, as well as, you know, on, even on the 3550s and 3560s, uh, you have to change the boot variables uh, to match the image that is in flash here. So the IR flash. And as you can see here, this image has to match what is in flash. If it does not, it will just crop up and give you an error and it will go into switch mode, which is basically just switch with a with a colon and it doesn't really do nothing. You're wondering why the network is down, and, you know, and people are complaining, and your telephone is ringing off the hook, but anyhow. But, you know, this feature is really cool for executing the same command on multiple switches. Uh, it is very nice to have, and if you use it correctly, it can be a real-time saver. But if you use it incorrectly, man, the consequences can get you fired. <laughs> but uh, with the chat, with the chat window and the send all tabs being demonstrated, there's another feature of Secure CRT I want to demonstrate, which is called the button bar, which is, uh, <laughs> sounds pretty cool. The button bar gives you the ability to create buttons. And you can label a button. I'm a button. And on here, you can actually uh, create a, basically a command and attach it to this button. So show ver. And what you're going to do is you're going to use the uh, slash r which sends a carriage return, which is basically the same thing as pressing enter. And when you uh, do the send string, you actually have different functions here. You want to do this as a send string, and just name the button, and voila, and it automatically does it. So you're probably wondering what this button feature is pretty good for. Now, it's really cool because, you know, anything that you can do on a Cisco command line interface, you can assign to a button command. For example, uh, delete flash, uh, 3550, so on and so forth. You can delete an image if the image exists, or if you want, you can actually create a button to upgrade the iOS. So, upgrade, man, I just can't type today. 3550, it's kind of embarrassing. My fingers just don't want to work. Uh, copy UTFTP, oh, so 16, image name, top down, flash, and voila. So actually, I forgot to specify the carries return. So when you, you have to specify this, otherwise it will just type the command for you and, and just wait for you to press enter. But if you type the, uh, the slash R, forward slash R, it will actually press enter for you. Or you can do the slash P, you can pause for one second if you want. There's all kinds of cool things here. But mostly for the buttons, you'll use the slash R and press OK on that. And when you click update, it will automatically do all this for you. Now, I have not really experimented with the button bar that much, but I do believe, yeah, you can do a new line. So basically, you can specify uh, like a command here, ASDF. Oh, ah, crap. Let's say at the bottom of this. Uh, come on, man. Then forward slash N. And then that basically sends a new line string, I'm assuming. Uh, do a slash R again. Let's see if that does. And I gotta wait for it to time out here. Just my luck. Give me one second here. But if you play around with the buttons quite a bit, you will realize the potential for them really quickly. I commonly use them for simple functions, uh, such as copying images to a, a specific device. Sometimes, you know, I'll just, instead of typing up the entire long command, I'll just assign a command with, with the latest image name and it's just press the button, voila, it does it for me. I can walk away, come back, and it's done. So, let me try this. Actually, yes, yeah, so that works exactly how I expected it to work. So if you use the forward slash n, it will send a, basically a new line command. And 
basically what it's saying here is you're executing this command, and you're pressing enter, and then you're starting a new line, and you're you're basically pressing enter again to confirm the destination file name. So it's pretty cool stuff. So uh, I think that's pretty much all that I'm going to touch on in this video here. Just got to wait for this thing to time out. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the configuration of an access server or terminal server or whatever you want to call it, feel free to post a question here uh, in the comments section of the lab page and my responses will be in blue because I am totally cool. Uh, other than that, uh, you can post questions on the Facebook page. Uh, be sure to join the Facebook group so that way when I post updates to the Facebook page you will get notifications. Also be sure to join the YouTube channel uh, so that way when I upload new videos you will get the new video alerts saying hey this cool new video has been posted, you should check me out. So, anyway. With all that being said, I hope this video has been educational for you, and thanks for viewing.